Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Welcome to lecture 35 on measure and integration. Uh, in the previous lectures, we had been looking at uh, the pth power integrable functions on a measure space x s mu and we have studied some general properties of this function, uh, these function spaces. Today, we will look at uh, in slightly more in detail uh, the special uh, subspace namely when p is equal to 2. So, we will look at today uh, the topic for today's discussion would be uh, the space L 2 x s mu, the space of uh, complex valued square integrable uh, functions. This is a special uh, uh, space uh, in the sense that this can be viewed as a generalization of the Euclidean spaces. Recall in uh, R n, the Euclidean space, we have the notion of a dot product of vectors, which uh, is related to the magnitude of the vectors and also help us to define the notion of uh, angles on R n. So, let us uh, uh, see what we can do as far as uh, L 2 is concerned. So, we look at the space L 2 of x s mu to be the space of all functions which are defined on x which are complex valued such that mod of f square d mu is finite. For such spaces, for L2, for a function f in L2 of x, we have defined the norm of this, which is equal to integral of mod f square d mu raised to power 1 by 2. We said that this uh, is very much like uh, the magnitude in R n. So, this is similar to to magnitude in R n. So, let us just uh, uh, briefly recall what was uh, the magnitude in uh, R n. So, for a vector, for a vector uh, say x in R n, the Euclidean norm is defined as look at the components. Uh, so, if x is having components x 1, x n, then look at mod of x i square sigma 1 to n and the square root of that. And for a function f in L 2, let us regard f as a vector with f x as the component. So, this is the xth component of f. So, how would we uh, define the uh, norm? So, look at the xth component f x, look at square. So, this is very much similar to uh, what we have done for Euclidean. Look at the component square and now sum it up but here the summation is over x and x is uh, any x belonging to x any indexing set. So, it is nothing but integral d mu and then the power 1 by 2. So, in that sense this is a perfect generalization of the Euclidean norm to uh, arbitrary uh, spaces. Now, on uh, uh, L 2 we have the notion of uh, on um, for a vector x belonging to R n with components x n, we have the uh, notion of uh, what is called the dot product. So, dot product uh, if x and y are two vectors with y components as y n, then x comma y the dot product is defined as x i y i i equal to 1 to n. 
and if uh, we are in a complex plane, so if x and y belong to C n, then the dot product x y is defined as sigma x i y i bar i equal to 1 to n. And this notion of a dot product is related to the magnitude in the following way that in either R n or C n either one the norm of x square is equal to the dot product of x with itself. And we know that the dot product in uh, R n or C n gives a notion of angle and orthogonality, which helps us to uh, do geometry in R n. So, uh, the basic um, uh, idea uh, of today's lecture would be the on the space L 2 of x, we already have the notion of norm, the notion of distance. Uh, we will define the notion of inner product or the notion of dot product on L 2 of uh, x and show how it is related to the notion of distance. So, that helps us to define the notion of orthogonality or perpendicularity of two elements in L 2. So, we get uh, we can do uh, geometry in L 2 of uh, x s mu. So, let us define what is the notion of the dot product in L 2. So, for functions f and g in L 2, uh, keep in mind our spaces are complex valued. So, define the dot product of f with g or also called the inner product of f with g as integral of f x g bar x d mu x, where this g bar is the complex conjugate of the function g. So, g bar of x is g x bar. So, this is uh, uh, defined. So, the uh, inner product or the dot product between f and g for two functions uh, f and g is defined as uh, the integral of f x g x bar d mu x, which is perfectly similar to uh, in uh, complex uh, c to the power n a i uh, b i bar. So, uh, the first uh, thing we want to say that this is uh, well defined and that uh, follows from um, uh, the holders inequality that we had proved. Uh, recall holders inequality uh, that said that if f is a function in L p and g is a function in L q then f into g is a function which is integrable and the integral of uh, uh, f g uh, is less than or equal to uh, the L 2 norm of. So, here is a, a typo. So, let me just uh, uh, say it once again what we are meaning here there should be integral. Okay. So, for holder inequality we had that if f belongs to L p and g belongs to L q then f g belongs to L 1 and integral mod f g integral of uh, mod of f into g d mu is less than or equal to the p th, uh, the p th norm of f and the q th norm of g. So, for p equal to 2, so that will give us that integral of f g d mu when p is equal to 2, uh, q is equal to 2. So, we have got that 1 over p plus 1 over q is equal to 1. So, the holder equality will give us that this is less than or equal to L 2 norm of f into L 2 norm of g. And this is nothing but our, uh, so this is nothing but uh, this is bigger than or equal to uh, f g inner product is less than or equal to this. So, that gives us uh, the Cauchy Schwarz inequality. So, this is also called the Cauchy Schwarz inequality, namely the inner absolute value of the inner product between f and g is less than or equal to the norm of f into norm of g. So, that says that this inner product is well defined, it is a well defined quantity. So, uh, so for every f and g in L 2, we have the notion of uh, the inner product. So, f into f comma g which is uh, the inner product is well defined quantity. And this behaves perfectly similar to that of the inner product for uh, ordinary vectors in R n or C n. Uh, that means, uh, this um, is a function which is defined on uh, L 2 cross L 2 and has the following properties. Namely, the inner product of f with f 
is always bigger than or equal to 0 and the equality holds if and only if f is equal to 0. So, let us look at this property that how is this true. So, inner product of f with itself is nothing but integral of mod f square uh, d mu. So, uh, this is always bigger than or equal to 0 and this will be equal to 0 if and only if our function mod f is equal to 0 almost everywhere. So, if and only if f is belonging to L 2 as a treated as an element of L 2 f is equal to 0. So, the first property is obvious namely the dot product of f with itself is always bigger than or equal to 0. And the second property says that the dot product or the inner product of f with g is same as the inner product of g with f. So, we are interchanging uh, f and g uh, and the complex conjugate of it. So, the inner product of f with g is same as the complex conjugate of the inner product of g with f and uh, that is uh, quite uh, uh, simple to verify from the definition. So, if we have got the inner product of f uh, with g, so the inner product of f with g is equal to f g bar d mu and that is equal to. So, inner product of f with g is equal to f g bar and that is equal to f bar g integral d mu bar. So, that is equal to and this is equal to uh, g comma f bar. So, uh, that uh, verifies the property namely uh, f the inner product of f with g is equal to the inner product of g with f bar. Similarly, it is easy to verify using that the integral is linear, it is easy to verify that the inner product is linear in the first variable that means alpha f plus beta g inner product with h is equal to alpha times the inner product of alpha f with h plus beta times the inner product of g with h. And uh, similarly, in the second variable is its conjugate linear because of uh, the property of uh, 2. So, f inner product with alpha g plus beta h is same as alpha bar of f g inner product f g plus beta bar of inner product of f h. So, in the second variable uh, it is not linear, it is a conjugate linear. And finally, this property is obvious namely the L 2 norm of uh, f is square root of the inner product of f with itself. So, all the, the properties that we have for uh, the dot product in R n or C n uh, are defined for uh, the inner product uh, in L 2. Uh, this is not, not uh, very uh, special for L 2. In fact, uh, one can uh, look at any vector space h uh, over the field of real or complex numbers. And if one has a, a function which is defined on h cross h taking values in the underlying field of real or complex having properties similar to that 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 of L 2. So, one can define what is called a inner product space. So, in general a inner product space is defined to be a vector space h on which there is a notion of uh, inner product defined and what is an inner product? It is a function defined on h cross h to r with those properties. So, once we have one has the notion of inner product that gives rise to notion of magnitude by the property that the magnitude of a vector u in h is nothing but is defined as the what defined as the dot product of u with itself square root. And one verifies uh, that Cauchy Schwarz inequality holds uh, uh, for this uh, kind of inner product and that means this is a well defined norm. So, Cauchy Schwarz inequality will say that is a norm defined on it and once you have the notion of norm uh, that gives rise to a metric uh, on the uh, uh, underlying vector space. And one can ask whether uh, it is complete under uh, that uh, metric or not. So, if on a vector space inner product is defined, so it becomes an inner product space and inner product space gives rise to a norm 
and if the underlying metric induced by the norm is complete, one says H is a Hilbert space. So, that is the general definition of a Hilbert space. So, our L 2 is an example of a Hilbert space, because L 2 x s mu is a vector space on which a notion of norm, the L 2 norm is defined and that L 2 norm is related to the inner product just now we have seen and we have already seen as Ries Fisher theorem, which said that L 2 x s mu is a complete metric space in the L 2 metric. So, this is an example of a uh, Hilbert space. Now, for uh, once we have the notion of uh, the inner product, we one can define the notion of uh, two elements in L 2 to be orthogonal or perpendicular to each other. So, we say two elements f and g in L 2 are orthogonal to each other if the inner product between them is equal to 0 and that is what we have uh, for vectors in R n also that the dot product is equal to 0. So, and we write this as f perpendicular to g. So, f perpendicular to g is defined as saying that the inner product of f with g is equal to 0. Now, we can also define the inner product if element f orthogonal to a subset s. So, writing it as f orthogonal to a subset s means that f is perpendicular to every element of s. So, f is perpendicular to s will mean that f is f comma h the inner product is equal to 0 for every element h of uh, h in s. So, similarly we can define orthogonality of two uh, sets also. With this one can uh, prove uh, uh, what is called the Pythagoras identity namely if f and g are two uh, functions in L 2 and f is orthogonal to g then uh, the norm square of f plus g is equal to norm f square plus norm g square. So, let us uh, just uh, quickly verify the Pythagoras identity namely if f and g are two elements in L 2 and f is orthogonal to g then we want to compute the L 2 norm of square of this. By definition this is related to the inner product. So, this is inner product of f plus g with itself and now using the property of uh, uh, linearity what we will get is this is f comma f plus g comma f plus f comma g plus the inner product of g with itself. So, that gives you norm of f square plus norm of last term will give you norm of g square, but f is orthogonal to g that means f comma g is equal to 0 and g comma f is also equal to 0. So, these two terms the inner product of g with f and f with g both are equal to 0. So, we get uh, what is called the Pythagoras identity namely the norm of f plus g uh, square is equal to norm f square plus norm g square whenever f is orthogonal to g. Let us carry over this uh, idea of orthogonality a bit further. So, let us take S any non empty subset of uh, L 2. We call S a subspace of L 2 those who have done uh, a bit of linear algebra will recognize this definition L 2 is a vector space. So, we are looking at a vector subspace of L 2. So, a set S is a non empty subset is called a subspace of L 2 if for any f and g in f and g in S. So, this should be uh, in S not in L 2 and alpha beta in complex numbers alpha f plus beta g belongs to S then we say S is a subspace. So, this is not L 2 it is S. So, that means for any two elements alpha beta in S the linear combination alpha f plus beta g should be in S. In that case it is called a subspace of S and a subspace uh, of S is called a closed subspace if it is closed under the metric uh, on L 2 that is L 2 metric. So, it, is, it should be a closed set that means what that means whenever we have got a sequence f n uh, in S and f n converges to uh, a function f in L 2 norm, then the limit must also be inside S. So, in uh, that is what is the definition of a closed source subspace. It is a subspace and it is a closed set uh, under the L 2 metric. So, that is the notion of a closed subspace. 
for given uh, set S in L 2 will denote by S upper suffix perpendicular. This is also called the orthogonal complement of S to be all elements in the space L 2 which are perpendicular to all elements of S. So, given a set S we are looking at all elements in uh, L 2 which are orthogonal to every element of S. So, that is called S perpendicular and this is uh, called the orthogonal complement of uh, S and the claim is that this is a closed subspace of uh, L 2. So, let us verify this fact that S a subset just a subset of L 2 and S perpendicular is the set of all elements f in L 2 such that f perpendicular to h for every h in S. Then claim is that first of all S perpendicular is a subspace, S perpendicular is a subspace. So, let us take uh, some h and g belonging to S perpendicular and alpha and beta belonging to C. Then alpha h plus beta g comma let us take an element f for f in S perpendicular uh, for f, S, f in uh, S. This will be equal to alpha times h f plus beta times g f using the property of uh, linearity in the first variable for the inner product. And now, because f belongs to S and h and g are in S perpendicular. So, this quantity inner product is 0 and the second inner product is 0. So, this sum this inner product is equal to 0. So, that says if h and g belong to S perpendicular and alpha and beta are in C, then alpha h plus beta g is always orthogonal to every element of S. Hence, it belongs to S perpendicular. So, S perpendicular is a subspace of the next let us prove that this is a, a closed subspace. So, next we want to check that it is a closed subspace. So, let f n belong to S perpendicular and f n converge to f in L 2. We want to check. So, claim that f belongs to f belongs to S perpendicular. So, to for that, so let us take an element, any element h belonging to S and compute, we want to compute f comma h. And the claim is this f comma h, so this is equal to f comma limit n going to, so what is h? Uh, what is, uh, sorry, uh, not, okay, this is not true. Let h belongs to S. Now, the claim is that since f n converges to f in L converges to f in L 2. So, this is equal to limit n going to infinity of f n comma h. So, uh, this is uh, a very simple thing to verify because if we look at the difference of the two. So, if we look at f h. So, why is this true? This is true because if we look at this inner product of f with h and inner product of f n with h and look at the absolute value of this then we can write this as. So, this quantity is equal to absolute value of f minus f n inner product with h and with this by Cauchy Schwarz inequality this is less than or equal to L 2 norm of f minus f n and L 2 norm of h and this goes to 0, this goes to 0. So, we get therefore, f with h inner product is equal to limit n going to infinity inner product of f n with h. And since each f n belongs to s perpendicular, h is in s. So, that uh, implies that each term is equal to 0. So, this is equal to 0 for every h belonging to s. So, that implies that f belongs to S perpendicular. So, this proves that S perpendicular for any set S, if we look at its uh, uh, orthogonal complement, then that is a closed subspace of 
edge. So, this is also called the orthogonal complement of the set. We next uh, state an important result which uh, seems geometrically obvious, which can be proved for any uh, Hilbert space. So, we will just uh, look at it uh, for our uh, uh, space L2. We will not prove this result, uh, we will just uh, assume this result and the proof uh, can be referred to uh, in the book. So, the result says that uh, if f is a L 2 function and s is a closed subspace of L 2, then look at the number alpha, which is the infimum of all the distances L 2 distances of f from g, where g is any element in s. Then the theorem says that this infimum is attained at some point in s. So, that means there exists not only it is attained, then there is a unique function f 0 belonging to s such that this infimum alpha is equal to norm of f minus f 0. And uh, further, if, uh, if this f does not uh, belong to, if f does not belong to s, then look at the difference of f minus f 0, okay, that is always going to be perpendicular to uh, s. So, that is the uh, claim of the theorem. Let me, we will not prove it, we will just geometrically analyze this result a bit. So, here is here is a closed subspace S. So, look at the closed subspace uh, uh, S of L 2 and uh, so this is a closed subspace of L 2 and we have got uh, a function f which is uh, outside it. So, what we are going to do is we are going to look at any point uh, inside uh, S a point G and look at the L 2 distance of this. Okay. So, look at the L 2 distances of various points. So, it says that there is a point which is there is a value called f 0 such that this distance L 2 distance of f from it is the minimum. And so, if this is 0, so look at so look at f minus f 0. So, that was so and this says if I look at f minus f 0, so, that is going to be orthogonal to it. Okay. So, that is uh, the theorem. So, is, so um, there exists a unique point f 0 belonging to S such that alpha the infimum is equal to the distance of f minus f 0 and f minus f 0 is perpendicular to S. So, look at this vector f minus f 0 that is always orthogonal to this S. So, geometrically in a sense given a point uh, and given a uh, subspace, it is kind of the projection, the projection gives you the minimum. Uh, so, this is a generalization of uh, the projection uh, the theorem for finite dimensional spaces. So, this is, uh, this is also called the best approximation uh, theorem for Hilbert spaces. So, let us just uh, say uh, look at once again, it says that if you are given a closed subspace of L 2 okay, and look at uh, uh, and you are given a function f in L 2, look at alpha the minimum uh, minimum of the distances between f and elements of G says there is a value, uh, there is a function in S which where this value is uh, attained. And uh, as a consequence of this, it also says that if S is the proper closed subspace of L 2, then its perpendicular cannot be uh, 0, because there is a, uh, if it is a proper, then there is an element f minus f 0, which is not 0, which is orthogonal to it. So, as a immediate consequence that if S is a proper subspace, proper closed subspace of L 2, then its orthogonal complement cannot be 0, it has to something else. So, that also means that if the orthogonal complement of something is 0, then S must be equal to L 2. Another way of stating the same thing is this. So, as I said, we will not be proving uh, this theorem, but we will give a, uh, some applications of this today. Uh, so, let us look at uh, some properties of uh, orthogonal complement before we go on to uh, prove some general facts. So, let us take S 1 and S 2 be subsets of L 2, uh, just subsets. Then the following properties hold, namely S 1 perpendicular is a closed subspace that we have already shown and S 1 perpendicular and S 1 
they intersect only at at the most at 0 they are just sets s1 perpendicular is a subspace because s1 uh, may not be a subspace so it says if uh, s intersection s perpendicular is always inside 0 and that is uh, obvious because if f belongs to s1 intersection s1 perpendicular then that means the inner product of f with itself because f belongs to s1 and it also belongs to s perpendicular that must be equal to 0 so that implies norm of f is equal to 0 and that implies f must be equal to 0 so it says so hence s1 intersection s1 perpendicular is inside 0 so as a obvious uh, consequence if s1 is also a subspace if s1 is also a subspace then s1 intersection s1 perpendicular they don't have anything common other than the vector the second property says that if s2 is a subset of s1 then s1 perpendicular is a subset of s2 perpendicular and that is obvious because uh, if we take uh, any element say h in s1 perpendicular then h the dot product or inner product of h with every element of s1 is equal to 0 and in particular with s2 is equal to 0 so that also belongs to s2 so this property is uh, obvious uh, the third property says that s1 is a subset of s1 perpendicular perpendicular so orthogonal complement of the orthogonal complement always includes uh, s1 so that property is again uh, uh, obvious because if we take uh, f belonging to s1 and h belonging to s1 perpendicular then we know that so then it implies h, uh, h comma f the dot product is equal to 0 because f belongs to s1 and h belongs to s1 perpendicular and that is equal to 0 but that means h is perpendicular to f and right so that means so this means uh, that uh, for every h in s perpendicular f comma h or h comma f is equal to 0 that means f is belonging to s1 perpendicular perpendicular so s1 is always a subset of s1 perpendicular perpendicular uh, we want to uh, show that so in case s1 perpendicular perpendicular equal to s1 in case these two are equal then the left hand side is a orthogonal complement of a subspace so this is a closed subspace okay so this is a closed subspace implies s1 is a closed subspace so implies s1 is a closed subspace and let us uh, prove the converse part namely the converse is also true so suppose s1 is equal to s1 perpendicular perpendicular then the claim that s1 is a subspace uh, s1 is a uh, uh, s1 uh, is a close then s1 is a, a closed subspace um, of uh, so th that sorry that we have already shown we want to prove the other way around so this is not what we want to is so so suppose s1 is a closed subspace so converse is if s1 is a closed subspace then we want to show s1 is also equal to s1 perpendicular perpendicular okay so to prove this suppose not so let us take let there exist f belonging to we want to this is a subset of this anyway so let us assume there is a s1 perpendicular perpendicular f not in s1 so let us assume that is so so in that case let us apply our uh, best approximation theorem so implies by the theorem just now we stated which we did not prove that there exists an element f naught belonging to 
S 1 such that F minus F naught is perpendicular to S 1. So, that means F minus F naught belongs to S 1 perpendicular, but also we have got F minus F naught belongs to. So, there is a uh, element F is in uh, not in S 1. So, there is element in um, F naught in S 1 such that the difference is perpendicular to uh, S 1. Now, let us observe that S 1. Now, let us observe that uh, this uh, element F naught belongs to S 1, F naught belongs to S 1 which is contained in S 1 perpendicular perpendicular. Okay. So, S 1 which is belong to S 1. So, that implies, so we have got F belonging to S 1 perpendicular perpendicular and F naught also belonging to that means, F naught S naught F minus F naught belongs to S 1 perpendicular perpendicular and F naught is also in the same thing and this being a subspace the difference must also belong to um, this belongs to S 1 perpendicular perpendicular. Okay. But now, the element now the element F minus F naught belongs to S 1 perpendicular perpendicular okay, and it also belongs to S 1 perpendicular. So, from here and here it follows. So, it belongs to a subspace and orthogonal complement of it that means, F minus F naught must be equal to 0 implying F is equal to F naught. Okay. So, that means what? That means, F belongs to F naught F and where is F naught? F naught is in uh, S 1. So, this F also belongs. So, we started with an F in S 1 perpendicular perpendicular and we are getting that F is equal to S naught where S naught is an element in S 1. So, that implies that F belongs to S 1. Okay. So, what we have shown is whenever F belongs to S 1 perpendicular perpendicular, it also belongs to S 1. So, these two are equal. So, that proves the fact that if S 1 that proves the fact that uh, if S 1 is equal to S 1 perpendicular perpendicular, then S 1 is a uh, closed uh, subspace of it. And next let us uh, observe the fact that if S 1 and S 2 are two closed subspaces and S 1 is perpendicular to S 2, then S 1 plus S 2 is also a, a closed subspace. So, let us uh, observe that S 1 S 2 are closed subspaces and S 1 is perpendicular to S 2. So, let us take um, two elements. So, let us uh, look at uh, S 1 plus S 2. We want to show it is a subspace. So, let us take uh, an element say F plus G in S 1 plus S 2, where F belongs to F 1 G 1 where F 1 belongs to S 1, G 1 belongs to S 2 and let us take another element F 2 plus G 2 also belonging to S 1 plus S 2, where F 2 belongs to S 1 and G 2 belongs to S 2. Then for every alpha and beta, alpha times F 1 plus G 1 plus beta times F 2 plus G 2 is equal to alpha F 1 plus beta G 2 plus alpha G 1 plus beta G 2. And now, because S 1 is a subspace, so alpha F 1 plus beta alpha F 1 plus beta F 2 from here it was beta F 2 and alpha G 1 plus beta G 2. So, this element belongs to S 1 and this element belongs to S 2. So, implies that this element belongs to S 1. So, this element belongs to S 1 plus S 2. So, that proves that S 1 plus S 2 is a subspace. To prove it is a closed subspace, let us observe. So, let F n plus G n belong to S 1 plus S 2, where F n belongs to S 1 and G n belongs to uh, S 2. And F n plus G n converge to F in L 2. So, we want to show that 
So, to show that S 1 plus S 2 is close, that means, we have to show that F belongs to uh, S 1 plus S 2. So, that is what we have to show. Now, let us observe that F n plus G n being convergent is Cauchy. So, F n plus G n is a Cauchy sequence. Okay is a Cauchy sequence. So, let us look at F n plus G n minus F m plus G m. So, this norm goes to 0 as n and m go to infinity. Okay. But now, note now note that F n minus F m belongs to S 1 and G n minus G m belong to S 2. So, this implies by uh, Pythagoras theorem that norm of F n plus G n F n minus F m square plus norm of sorry, uh, the norm of f n minus f m square plus norm of g n minus g m square. This is equal to norm of f n plus g n minus f m minus g m square. So, that is by Pythagoras theorem and this goes to 0. So, that implies that norm of f n minus f m goes to 0 and norm of g n minus g m goes to 0. So, meaning what? This says that f n itself is Cauchy and g n itself is Cauchy. So, that implies that f n is a Cauchy sequence is Cauchy implying that f n must converge to some h. Similarly, g n must converge to some g all in L 2 and similarly, uh, so, so that implies that f n plus g n converges to h plus g and, but we know that this converges to f. So, that implies that f. So, this implies that f is equal to h plus g. Now, note that f n is a sequence in uh, uh, S 1 and S 1 is closed. So, this h belongs to, so this h belongs to S 1 and g belongs to S 2. So, this belongs to S 1 plus S 2. So, this completes a proof that if S 1 and S 2 are closed subspaces and S 1 is perpendicular to S 2, then S 1 plus S 2 also is a uh, closed uh, subspace. And finally, uh, we uh, cl claim that if S 1 is a closed subspace, then and the then we know that S 1 intersection S 1 perpendicular is 0. So, in that case L 2 is equal to S 1 plus S 1 perpendicular. And the reason for that is because this intersection is uh, 0. So, there cannot be S 1 plus S 1 perpendicular is a closed subspace. So, there has to be an element if it is not whole then there must be an element outside which is not true. So, that means for every closed subspace S 1 uh, of uh, L 2, L 2 can be expressed as S 1 plus S 1 perpendicular. That means, every element of L 2 can be represented as an element in S 1 plus an element in S 1. Uh, perpendicular and this decomposition will be unique because S 1 intersection S 2 is uh, S 1 perpendicular, S 1 is a subspace. So, there is nothing uh, common between them. So, this is also uh, called sometimes the projection theorem that means, for every closed subspace S 1 of L 2, L 2 can be re represented as S 1, one writes as a direct sum of S 1 perpendicular namely these two are equal and the intersection of these two subspaces is equal to uh, 0. Fine. Next, let us come to uh, a 
analyzing uh, maps on the space L2, which is a vector space. As on any vector space, you can one can analyze linear maps on the vector space taking values uh, in the underlying field. Here, the our vector space is L2. Actually, it is a Hilbert space. So, look at a map which is a linear map T from L2 to C. We say it is a boundary linear functional uh, if it has the following properties. First of all, it should be linear as a so T is a linear map as a vector space L2 to C. And secondly, we want that it is uh, bounded in the sense that if for uh, there is a constant m such that norm of T f is less than or equal to m times the norm of f 2. So, this is called the boundedness of the um, boundedness of the linear map T. So, we say T is a bounded linear functional if T is linear on L 2 and now, uh, an absolute value of T f is less than or equal to a constant m times f, where m is a constant fixed and this happens for every f uh, in uh, L 2. It is quite easy to this condition boundedness is actually uh, it implies that T is also uh, continuous, because if uh, f n converges to f, then T f n uh, absolute value is less than or equal to norm of uh, m times the norm of f n minus f and that will go to 0. So, it is easy to verify that uh, T uh, which is uh, uh, if it is bounded, if the linear map is bounded if and only if it is continuous and uh, because you are on a vector space continuity at 0 is enough. So, one can verify easily that uh, every bounded linear map is continuous at 0 is equivalent to it. One way of defining uh, linear maps, continuous linear maps is the following. The for fix any uh, g in L 2 and look at the map T lower g defined on L 2 to be T g at f is equal to f comma g for every f. So, that means that the value of T g at f is defined as f g inner product of f with g for every f okay and it's easy to see, see that this is a linear map because because of the inner product is linear in the first variable so that will give that uh, it is a linear uh, map and it is bounded because of the cauchy schwarz inequality so this is linear and by the cauchy schwarz inequality it is a bounded linear map so one way of uh, constructing uh, bounded linear functionals on L 2 is by taking the inner product of any element f with a fixed element g. And this is important uh, theorem uh, called uh, Dries representation theorem, which says that this is the only way of constructing bounded linear functionals on L 2. So, it says that uh, t if t is any bounded linear functional then there is a unique uh, uh, g 0 belonging to L 2 such that T f is equal to f g naught. That means, uh, every linear functional on f uh, or linear functional T on L 2 arises via inner product of f with a fixed element g 0 and this g 0 is also unique. Uh, let us just outline the proof of this. So, first of all let us observe that the uh, there are two cases. Look at uh, suppose that there does not exist any g 0 with the required claim, then what will happen? Then g 0 must belong to what is called the kernel of uh, T of g, right? Because so that means what? And kernel of g is all elements say that which are mapped to 0, and this is a closed subspace of uh, kernel of uh, 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 bounded linear functional is a closed subspace. So, if there is no g, then this will be so. That means, that uh, our required claim uh, will hold with t equal to 0. So, that is essentially saying the kernel of T g is a closed subspace of uh, g and if uh, I, one possibility is kernel of T g is equal to the whole space, then uh, it is equal to 0. Okay? Because if kernel of T g is equal to uh, the whole space, then T g will be identically 0. So, any g 0 will uh, satisfy, okay. g 0 equal to 0 will uh, satisfy. So, let us assume 
that the kernel of T 0 is a proper uh, closed subspace of it. Then by the best approximation theorem G 1, there is a G 1 in kernel of T perpendicular. Okay? That is the consequence of the best approximation theorem and this G 1 will not be equal to 0. So, in that case one verifies that if we take G 0 to be equal to T G 1 divided by G 1 comma G 1 into G 1, if we this selection of G 0 is the required unique function say that T of f is equal to f G 0 for every f in L 2. So, essentially um, uh, one applies the best approximation theorem to get an element G 1 in kernel of T perpendicular. Okay. And uh, why one is looking at kernel in G in kernel of T perpendicular is because if the required condition is to hold, then that function G 0 has to belong to kernel of T perpendicular, because if it is G comma f and, uh, and that means for f in kernel that must be 0. So, that the required G 0 has to be from here. So, let us pick up any element and then modify it and show that that is the required. So, this is what is called uh, the Ries representation theorem. So, this is the Ries representation theorem. So, uh, today what we have looked at is the space L 2 uh, is a perfect generalization of the space of uh, uh, the R n or the space C n. That means, there is a notion of a inner product uh, defined on it, which gives which is related to the norm and which gives the notion of perpendicularity. So, we proved uh, we stated one important theorem namely if S is any closed subspace of uh, L 2 and you take an element f in L 2, then there is a best approximator, then there is an element uh, G uh, 0 uh, in the space uh, closed subspace which best approximates uh, with a minimum distance from f. And as a consequence of this, one consequence is the projection theorem namely every close uh, uh, if s is any closed subspace of L 2, then L 2 is a direct sum of s plus uh, s per perpendicular. And the second consequence is characterizing all bounded linear functionals on the Hilbert space L 2, namely uh, linear func the only way uh, bounded linear functionals can be constructed on L 2 is by the inner product. That means, uh, T of f, if T is a bounded linear functional, then T of f must be equal to the inner product of f with an element G 0 uh, in for some for some element G 0 with the inner product. So, that is uh, characterization of uh, bounded linear functionals. Thank you.